So weight is final, and that is where cult begins. It doesn't start as cult. It starts as a, a genuine church, and it goes through a process of occult, and the last stage, it becomes cult. Once it becomes cult, it is where the, the, the church leader is recognized as a spiritual father. Because of even if people, they, they come physically and attend church there physically, but they also belong into a spiritual family. And this spiritual family will make sure that it breaks all your physical and biological relationship with your biological family. You no longer have a good family, whether with your wife or whether with your kids or whether with your husband. Your world, it is in this church. And during that time, we had several church programs because the intention is to keep people in the church. That is the reason why in most cases you find people staying in that particular church because they have to be in the church. They have to be far away from the world. Their systems wants them to be locked in that church so that indoctrination can be easy on them. So we had several services. We call them miracle services, breakthrough services, prophecy services we came with different names so that the lives of our follower could be associated with church and the the teaching or the preaching in those churches we don't preach christ i remember very well when i came they told me and said when you preach you should not preach about christ you should preach about prosperity. You should preach and promote about witchcraft. People have been troubled by, by witches at night. People have been bewitched by family members and all those kind of preachings. So the preaching is an indoctrination of fear and bondage. Because when you listen to such sermons, when such sermons fill up your mind and your spirit, after church service, you start to be confused and you start wondering and said, last night, indeed, I had an, a, a, a dream where people were chasing me. So this means that I've got a spiritual attack. And when people realize that, we open what we call one-on-one -on -one consultation. So this is a system, as I've said, Mr. Chair, that it starts as a church and it goes into a level of acquiring power from which doctors are becoming part of a secret society and once it becomes part of the secret society it becomes part of a cult where the church leader has the final weight on every member in the church and once it becomes an occult it goes to what we call one-on-one -on -one consultation the real purpose of one-on-one -on -one consultation mr chair is to have a direct influence to your members because pulpit it's where you use it to advertise your powers or to demonstrate your powers to the crowd and once people saw that you are able to prophesy people calling them by names which i will come on that part on how do they do it people long to have a chat with you on one on one or, or on a private space so that is where the one-on-one -on -one platform are always associated to this kind of practices now the pulpit or a sunday service it is not a normal service like the churches where we we come from or our traditional churches as we know them especially here in south africa we know that on a sunday service a family will come just to worship the Lord. But in this setting, a Sunday service is a place where the cult leader sat down and he, he brought a strategy to raise money. Because in every service, there have to be a miracle. And after that particular miracle, there have to be money that is raised. 
money in which sense? In other churches, they will collect normal offering, as we know it. And after collecting normal offering, they will give a space and say, go and buy the oils which are, are, have been uh, set at a particular corner in the church. They, they open the sales in the house of the Lord. So people are able to go and buy the merchandise in the house of the Lord. And how do they do it? Firstly, they will allow a testimony to come. Somebody will come. Most of them, they've been bought. They, they, they buy this testimony. Others, it is true, they have experienced a certain power, but their testimony has been scripted down. They tell you how to say it. Before you can come and speak direct what comes from your heart, you meet the, uh, the senior prophet or the church leader or the cult leader, and he will tell you on how to say it. A lot of testimonies, a lot of testimonies that we see on these churches, it is not what comes from the heart. It is what has been manipulated, and somehow it is very amazing on how they manipulate it. Let's say, for an example, somebody says, I've been looking for a job, and since I used this oil, I did not get a job. Now, the one who is a spiritual leader or a spiritual father will be the one putting weights in that person's mouth and say, the reason you did not get a job is because of witchcraft in your family. So when you testify there, you should say, the reason I did not get a job was witchcraft. And after I have used the oil, I've got a job. So how they structure their testimony is to promote the power of the cult leader and also the product that has been sold in the church. Then after that, people, they will flock and buy those oils. Once you have bought any material from those churches, you, you accept what I call a spiritual covenant. And this is where it's a little bit tricky because it does not happen like a normal covenant or you don't take an oath like what I have done this morning, Mr. Chair. This one, it happens spiritually. In which sense? In the following sense. Once you, you use, whether it is the water from the church or the oil or the salt, whatever point of contact that you use from that particular church, it is followed by episodes of dreams. Because these are spiritual matters. It, don't, it does not manifest in the physical world. It starts by dreams. What kind of dreams? You can see yourself in that church. And you see yourself with the pastor giving you instruction. Those are the kind of dreams. The other kind of dreams, it can be sexual dreams. Where a member always experience this continuous kind of dreams. Other kind of dreams, they see themselves being underwater. It starts as a dream. Other dreams, they see themselves with the church leader giving them something to eat. And after they have dreamed those kind of dreams, they go back to the cult leader and say, I have experienced this kind of dream. I need spiritual help. And the cult leader understands very well the interpretation of those dreams and what does it stand for. And he will be able to take them from step one to another step. That is the reason a member of such church, even if they can have a headache, instead of going and buying panad or grandpa, they go to the cult leader to consult for a headache. Because their life has been controlled by this church. So anything that happens to them, they have to go and get a clarity from the cult leader. And the cult leader is in a position where he's able to manipulate and do what it pleases. Others have been raped by the same cult leader, but it does not look like rape, Mr. Chair. The reason why it doesn't look like rape, it is because after this individual had this particular dream where he saw herself in an intercourse and intimate space with a church leader, the following day he starts or she starts to develop, this particular person starts to develop certain desires to this cult leader. 
And as she goes and explains to the cult leader what she has dreamt, the cult leader knows and understands very well that a seed of lust has been deposited in this particular person. So the cult leader will only act on those that he has identified certain signs on them. And that is the reason why their raping process will be continuous. It will be something that happens today and it, it comes again after a month, it comes and funny enough, you find it is the victim driving her car or the victim, the victim moving to the cult leader just to be raped. I am sorry to put it that way, but that is how it is. And these cult leaders, before they, 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 they can do those acts, they groom their people. By grooming, I'm referring to where they make sure that they give you a position that is closer to them. You are, you are able to see their bank balances or bank statements so that they can show you how powerful they are. They are able to even speak with politicians on a loudspeaker where this woman who's been groomed will be listening and talk to high profile people, business people, people of influence. And by so doing, they are making this one who's gonna be a victim of rape to look up to this man as a powerful man. And once the cult leader has made sure that he has groomed this person, and that is where the actual acts begin. The difference between this kind of, 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 of rape or, or abuse with the one that we normally hear on the news or we read, it is they don't go outside the church. These cult leaders uses the church, their church, usually they call it their church because they are the founders of those church, uses their church as a place to pick which one they want to use as a victim. They cannot go outside on the street and do that because they will lose the case. But they make sure that they use those people in the church who have been initiated to believe in them. And these powers, how does it operate? Once you, you join, it is like you are selling your soul. By selling your soul, it means that you allow your body to become an instrument of demons. Because when you start performing those miracles or you, you prophesy to people, it is the demon that you have acquired from that particular place that is in operational upon your life. And once that demon is controlling your life, the demon will come and have a particular habit or character upon your life. You are a man of the cloth, but this particular demon pushes you to go to the taverns and drink. After a powerful sermon, you find yourself in the tavern drinking. This is the demon inside of you. This demon makes you to, to have multiple relationships. So you find that there's an imbalance between what you are preaching and what you are living. Because of preaching, you are using your gift and your experience. The Bible says the gift of the Lord, they are without repentance. Some of these leaders, they've got charisma. So they use their charisma and experience, but while they are character, portrays that of a sinner. So there is that imbalance. And once there is that kind of imbalance, followers of that particular church will also begin to behave like their leader. We normally call it transference of spirit. But it, it has to do with more of grooming, if we have to be literal. Because of the pastor will be close to the worship team members, in most of the time, they are women. And as he's part of them, he starts to show them his private life. And by so doing, he is grooming them to live a sinful life. And in the worst case scenario, that is where you find a, a one man who is sleeping with five women who are part of the worshiping team in the same room at the same time. 
And when such things happen, they don't talk about it because they say this is our deity, it's our spiritual father. And when they do those things, they twist the word of God. And these young people, they don't question because they've realized this is a man of power who is able to talk with politicians, who's able to talk with influential people. So whatever he says, it means we have to follow it. Thank you, Mr. Tache. Stability. I would say, as we know that uh, every, every church has to belong into a body. But once you start to, to move away from a body and you start to become a body by, by yourself, it shows that you don't want to be accountable. In my instant, I, I graduated and I was ordained by the Apostolic Faith Mission. But after my ordination, I started what is called independent ministry. Now, independent ministry did not ordain me, but I was a pastor without a license because my license was supposed to serve in the Apostolic Faith Mission. So what is happening is that we have people who rush to the Bible College just to get the license but the ministry where they are now serving has nothing to do with that license. It is like you go and you get a code 10 license, but you come and you drive a code 14 vehicle. So I was operating independent without a license because my license, uh, I was supposed to serve in the Apostle Faith Mission. So I served there without the license and without accountability. And as I was serving there, I, you know, power, power, I, I want the correct word, that power is dangerous because of it grows in you. Once you start preaching, there's no tempting place like the pulpit. Once you start standing there, people clapping hands for you when you preach, you start to develop more hunger for power. So I was not satisfied with the gift that I had of preaching or the message that I had. I wanted more power. And more power, I, I knew that the Bible College could not offer me this particular thing. So I had to look for those who are doing this. And those are people who have been in the ministry. So that is where I diverted and I never went back to the Apostolic Faith Mission by then. Because I knew that they won't accept these practices. So I stayed with the independent ministry so that I can be free to do anything. So when a person begins uh, the issue of being independent, it means that they are running away from accountability. So that is the core reason, I can say in a simple sentence. Coming back to the issue of the secret society. It does not mean that it's only in Nigeria where you have a secret society. The, the word secret is universal and it means something that is hidden. Once you have a group of people who know a particular truth and, without, uh, and they don't want to expose that particular truth, then it's a secret. It's a secret group. So the secret society in this instance is a people who use witchcraft powers and they are aware this is witchcraft powers but they hide it from their followers they preach to their followers and say don't go to traditional doctors and consult while them are clients there and some of them they're not just clients some of them they they've been initiated as traditional doctors so they they, they are traditional doctors and also they are pastors charismatic pastors so this is where we call it a secret society because they don't reveal their true identity. We just see them as men of the cloth. Now this group of people, especially the one that I belong to, you must have a sign to show that you belong to. They made a sign on my body, on my left hand. They made these three stripes here. These are the three stripes where they said, with these stripes, you will be able to see other members of this house, other pastors in your country, 
If you look at their left hand, others, they've got these three stripes. It's a sign. And once you meet these particular people, you don't greet them with your uh, right hand. You greet with the left hand because you belong in the same spiritual family. So they, they start to influence your behavior. They tell you what you must not eat. They tell you how to live your life. They even tell you that the money that you make, you must send it back to them. So your you are no longer in control of your life. You are in control of the demons that you have acquired and you are in control of the society that is ruling your life. And if you want to come out, they will tell you and say, if you want to come out, we will kill you, you will die. And this secret society does not only uh, have pastors. You know, in, in our towns, we have these ones who are called uh, Dr. Mama, or these ones who put their posters there. Those are part of the cult. They work together. Because of, it's either you do it traditionally or you do it via a church where you will disguise as a prophet. Now, these ones who are called Dr. Mam, they are the ones if you, you have any problem, you take the names of your church member, then you give it to this one who will do a consultation to the spirits during the week and he will give you what we call a feedback. And on Sunday, you have a data of what is called prophecy. When you go to your pulpit, already you know that Norma has a problem because of Dr. Mama has consulted the, the spirit. So you stand there and you give out a prophecy that has a, a network of all these other uh, 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 role players who are not Christians. So in a nutshell, I can say, Leaders who are part of a secret society are controlled by the secret society. In, in a worst case scenario, they even tell you that uh, your church members have to change and put on a uniform. And once you come to the church, you will say, God has spoken to me. And it is not God. It is the God of the society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Previously, when we had other um, people testifying here, they spoke of the power that they went to get in Benin, in, uh, in uh, West Africa. And uh, one, I think, even spoke of it as voodoo. So, uh, wondering whether the West African, the Nigerian experience is the same as the experience in, of Buddha in Benin. The second question is uh, when you look at Southern Africa, South Africa especially, there is a lot of uh, people are really attracted I just wonder if perhaps there is a difference between the people in South Africa as opposed to the people in other parts of the African continent when it comes to being attracted to this. Or what is it about us that makes us so susceptible to this type of uh, uh, fetish that we go in though we even Then I wanted to hear from you what you see as the intersection between witchcraft and uh, the work of traditional industry. So I, um, I, I'm wondering how, 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 how you see that. I was going to ask you about also about whether there is a convention, whether there is a secret society in South Africa where the people like yourself who are the initiated to this uh, uh, have got a kind of uh, fraternal relationship with others but you already answered that because you spoke of the three stripes so I think we can go now to each other. So I'll let that one slide. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Commissioner Langa, for these three important questions. I will start with the issue of power, where the Commissioner asked about the voodoo, or what kind of powers are, are being used in these churches. They are different kind of, of powers. In this book, The Church Mafia, I speak about how I traveled. I did not go only to Nigeria. I also went to Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, where I was initiated and I saw what is called Mamba Muntu. That is a half crocodile and a half human being. And I saw it with my eyes. I was not drunk. I was not under any influence. I saw it. It came. We went to the river during the night. It was a full moon. The light that was there was from the moon. As we went in that river in an island called Congolo, in DRC, an island called Congolo. And when we went there, the man who was going to initiate me, they spoke French there. So the one who was interpreting for me is the one who took me there. So we went in, into the water and they did some incantation. And after doing some incantation, this being, it came, as you were in the water, you were able to see during the night, it's quiet. You are able to see some movement from a distance. The water was just splashing. There was a sound and it took my concentration. I saw it was coming. I did not know what it was, but they told me that they are going to call their God, which is half human being and half crocodile. This thing came with a very powerful speed. You know, if a, a person is swimming as a human being, you are able to know this one is a human being by the speed. But this one, it was an extreme speed. It was coming and it came behind me at my back. It held me here. I'm talking something that I saw it. Now, I, I, I could sense that it was big and the cloth and the hand that touched me here, it was not of a human being. It baptized me as in putting me in the water and after that it gave me something like an egg because I could not look at it because I was afraid. It gave me something like an egg, then I had to swallow the egg with the shell. Then from then, the man did some incantation, then it went away. The way it was breathing, I, I could tell it is not a human being. As they gave me the, uh, the description, they said it's a half human being and a half crocodile. And the hand, I could see this one, it was more of a lizard with nails. Now, after that episode, I had the encounter where I dreamt, it was a vision, this one, where I dreamt being underwater, and been given instruction. So there is a physical manifestation that is also connected to dreams. So when a person has dreams, they are connected to the physical manifestation. So coming back to the uh, question of power, as I've said, these church leaders, uh, Commissioner Langa, they acquire different kinds of powers. The voodoo power, it's, it's one of the powers. And that is the reason why these days, in most of these mega churches, on their pulpit, you find that they have, they call it decoration, but it's not decoration. They put fruit. You know, the, when you worship voodoo, you can do your own research. They put fruit on the particular God. Where the God is, there must be those fruits as a sign of a sacrifice. So on this pulpit, they are very beautiful, but they are surrounded with fruits. So that is a sign to show and say, on that pulpit, it is an altar of a voodoo. Because fruits in the church has nothing to do with the church. So those fruits, they, they are a sign that we have sacrificed, we are giving you these fruits. And after the service, they can say, everyone come and pick up the apples. And people, they will go and pick up those apples, they start to eat. But they don't know that those fruits there, they've been sacrificed to the God, which is voodoo. And it does not end there. 
Others, they even go to an extent of using what we call marine spirits, which is called the water spirit. Water spirit has a, a, a background where you can trace it also in the Bible. It comes a long way. Now, this water spirit, number one, the church where your church is, it must be next to the water. There must be a river next to the water where you are able to take people for what we call baptism. But this is not the same baptism that Jesus encountered. This is a baptism into an, into an ocal. It's more of initiation. So they use the water or the river that is next to the water. Or they can even have a, a swimming pool in the church. If they have a swimming pool in the church, all members will have to via through that water. If they don't have a swimming pool in the church, they can make a, a service, a special service, where the pastor will say, I'm coming to wash your feet. Out of the blue, the pastor says, I just, God spoke to me that I can wash your feet. And every member in the church will take off their shoes because this is the marine kingdom that wants to influence the church. So every member of the church has to via through that particular water. So the pastor will come and wash you. He will take his time. He's a busy man, but he has to make sure that he does that by himself with his own hands. He'll bath your feet. That is what we call the uh, marine powers. In other instances, they, they use what they call do as I say. In my instance, they gave me a small horn. It was called Ashe. It's a Nigerian name. It's called Ashe. Now, with that horn that they gave me, they said before I could talk, I have to wrap that uh, particular uh, uh, muti on my tongue before I go to the pulpit. So they, they collect a lot of, of powers. Others, they even bury uh, 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 live, 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 live cows, live animals in the church so that uh, their church can remain as powerful as they want it to be. So attending such churches, it, it makes church members to be victims of these kind of powers. You go to one building, but you've got more than 20 powers and you are not aware. Yet you are the one shouting the name of Jesus while you have been possessed by many powers in that particular church. And these powers, they work for one purpose, to bring the crowd. All they want is numbers. So they do anything that they can for these powers. And all these powers, as I have said earlier on, they've got their own characteristics. Some of the powers, they, they want blood sacrifice. That is the reason other members will die. They can be a stampede in that hall. They can be a stampede in that crusade but life has to be lost in that particular environment. Others who are close and who've got, let's say, a, a particular gift, you can be a musician who's been loved by people in that church, and you are close to the pastor. As time goes on, the musician can have an accident. So they cause some of the members to experience an uh, untimely death because those will be part of the sacrifice that these powers are looking for. I'm coming to the issue of South Africans. If are we the only one who are being these victims? When I went to Nigeria, I, I, I was shocked to see how the world, that's especially the religious world, it is that side. People are practicing occult openly, Mr. Chair. In Nigeria, it's not something that people can hide it. And uh, uh, it was my first time to see a lot of churches, mega churches, where there is a lot of following, but they don't believe in Christ. Remember, I'm from South Africa. I'm from a Bible college. Even if I was looking for power, but my world says, if there is witchcraft, everybody hides. We don't talk about witchcraft. But in that country, people are proud to say, I'm the best witch here and I can do and undo. That's what they love saying. I can do and undo. I can open and close. So, in South Africa, I think the lack of, of awareness, 
because of these people, they hide through the gospel. They bring the gospel as a, a, a point of attraction while they know that they are practicing these particular practices. So in South Africa, the lack of knowledge, most of South Africans, they were like me before I went to Nigeria. They did not believe that you can use witchcraft in the church. But my experience has taught me that it is possible to have an occult priest who is a witch and who is uh, uh, preaching on a Sunday at the same time because of what they say it is not what they do. Privately, they are occult priests and on Sunday, they stand as the men of God. So, South Africans, we, we are at risk because of these people, not only foreigners, these days it is not foreigners, even, even our own brothers here in South Africa, they are, they are joining this train, they are moving here, going out, going to acquire power, and once they have given you power, it's usually a snake. This is a snake that grows, and when it grows, you must have spiritual sons that will be able to impart the same power they've given to you to others. So a lot of pastors, they go there, they collect these snakes from Nigeria, they bring it here to South Africa, it makes them a uh, prosperous, famous, and here is a young pastor from the Bible College, like I was at that particular time. I looked to this pastor, I joined him, he gives me part of the snake, and he also goes and becomes a spiritual father. And you will target somebody else. And the other painful part, Mr. Chair and uh, the Commission, it is that once you collect these powers from this country, you must make an oath that through you, other members of the secret cult, they will come to South Africa. So once you are successful using those powers, you will go back and collect other members who are struggling in that village and you bring them here to South Africa and you open a branch. You give them money, you do everything, they need a branch. And what happens? South Africans, they flock there and they call another one. They come. So this, it becomes a chain. And all these foreign, most of these foreigners, they work with our local pastors. They work with people who are in high position of influence, pastoral fraternity. Most of those people in, in, in those top uh, uh, position, they work with them, but it looks as if they are fighting. When you look at them, it's like, I know, they are fighting, but they know that they are working together. So in answering the second question, I will say South Africans, we become victims because we don't know what is occult. South Africans, we don't believe that witchcraft can be practiced in the church coming to the issue of the difference between the witchcraft and the traditional doctors i will say you can find witchcraft practice in the church done by a man of the cloth you can find witchcraft in a traditional doctor done by a traditional doctor so in my own understanding, witchcraft is when you use powers for evil use or for evil purposes. That is witchcraft. Traditional doctor are people who use traditional ways, ancient ways, ancestral practices to do their practices. But even in that particular group, you can find those who don't sleep at night and they do their own things. And when you come to the house of the Lord, it is a, a modified witchcraft practice where one is given a bottle of oil and they will tell you, this oil is do as I say, you must pour it in the foot of your husband. Just because of it has a sticker of your church and is written from Jerusalem, then we say this is not witchcraft, but it is the same practice. Some of the women, they, they, they've been told that during the night, around 12 o'clock, open that oil, speak and call your husband wherever he is so those are witchcraft practices in the church thank you sir